primarily what we will do today is take a very quick look at this essay commonwealth literature does not exist yeah it is by Rushdie I think it is part of your course material even if you have not taken a look at it or if you do not have access to this it is uh, fine we are not really discussing the essay but I am I'm, I'm thinking that this essay in fact either it can be used as an entry point to many issues related to English literary uh, studies about commonwealth literature in general about the way we use certain terms to talk about particular kinds of literature and he opens up the um, uh, what, what do you call it he opens up this site called English literary studies in multiple ways so it is a useful essay in that sense we may or may not again agree with many of the things that he says and the other thing is that I thought it is rather fitting to begin with Rushdi and end with Rushdi in, uh, yeah, because uh, regardless of the um, the controversial statements or the regardless of the some of the baseless claims even that uh, he makes yeah he he has opened up a lot of avenues there are a lot of questions that he began to raise it's uh, it's not as if he is the one who began to identify this as a problematic site and began to ask these questions but the questions assumed validity and legitimacy the moment Rushdi began asking them yeah so that's the usefulness of his intervention in this space called English literary studies and particularly related to uh, Indian fiction or Indian literature yeah so here he uses this term commonwealth literature before we come into uh, uh, before we start talking about this uh, uh, essay I wanted to think about how Indian fiction in English as a course is positioned in this larger program that you are doing yeah so this is you are doing a course uh, and an and, uh, and, uh, a postgraduate course in English literary studies where there is a certain way in which the center is defined that is very clear the historical sense which is given to you in a very extensive fashion it is about British literature the traditions which are being uh, projected as the yardstick yeah, the uh, critical tradition yeah, those are primarily and very significantly uh, British so that is a starting point that you begin with and though you will be looking at many many other things like in the literature like post colonial writings and new ways of looking at literature in some form or the other the center remains the same yeah the English literature the proper British literature that is a center yeah and this is further validated by uh, let us take the case of you know exams like UGC yeah it is not as if uh, Indian literature is the center of what is being tested in those exams yeah again it is about English literature and some of the things which are there in the periphery so when you think about the structure of the course the program that you, you the academic program that you are doing at the center we have English literature studies where there is a fixed canon yeah starting from Chaucer and Shakespeare and uh, we do not again significantly do not do much from the modern if you think about you know the way your own courses are structured we do not do much of the British writing in the 20th century but nevertheless look at the trajectory there is a foundation there is a setting and to this newer forms of literatures are introduced if you are asked after the end of your course if you are asked about how much you know about Indian literary tradition or Indian critical tradition apart from perhaps one or two term papers that you may or may not have uh, worked on or some presentations that you heard we may not know much about Indian literature or Indian uh, critical tradition yeah and we keep going back to the western frameworks to access the text we keep using western uh, frameworks to do you know lit crit yeah to act lit, uh, to do a literary criticism of any of the works which are available to you and whenever you are departing you also need to centrally state that we are moving away from the dominant paradigm which is being given to you so this needs to be this is the context which I want you to be aware of as and when we progress with the, with this discussion so if we take a look at the range of texts that we uh, brought to this class starting from Raj Mohan's wife yeah I will quickly read out the list to you so that you know you can uh, also think about the discussions that we had as part of uh, uh, these novels Raj Mohan's wife Kantapura waiting for the Mahatma untouchable yeah that belongs to a different uh, the, the earlier phase in some sense then we have heat and dust the strange case of Billy Bishwas cry the peacock midnight's children the shadow lines and uh, with two novels by Alan Seeley, Trotanama and Zell Aldinus from two different point, different historical frameworks. There's Ice Caddy Man, God of Small Things, Riot, 
the hungry tide, uh, labanum for my head, English August, remains of the feast, white tiger and um, between the assassinations then uh, inheritance of loss. Yeah. So, this is the fairly vast corpus of writing we, we brought to this class and as the title of the course suggests this can be conveniently put under Indian fiction in English and occasionally we spoke about how whenever Pasha literature is also being introduced, whenever the linguistic question is being used, whenever certain regional variants of this uh, Indian fiction in English is also brought in. For example, the writings from the Northeast, there are certain uh, difficulties for including, we are not too sure of the framework, yeah, so on and so forth. Now, but the moment you introduce, you bring a new term, not a new term, an old term which is still uh, in currency. Commonwealth literature. Yeah, you can put everything inside this. Yeah, you can. The region does not really matter. The kind of writing does not matter. The theme does not matter. And uh, Commonwealth literature is. Uh, I, I hope you are all familiar with the term. It is about the kind of literature which is come out from the nations which were under the Commonwealth. Yeah, the nations which were under the uh, yeah under the British uh, monarchs rule. Yeah. And uh, this also excludes British literature. Yeah, this is not in including British literature. All nations which were under the British uh, monarch's rule, minus uh, Britain. Yeah, so the writings which are produced from Britain, it is still considered as English literature. Yeah, and there are certain ways in which Commonwealth literature is also it also becomes synonymous to uh, English uh, literature. So it's a it's not a a very well defined category, very well defined uh, space of uh, uh, literature. Yeah. So, but um, yeah, this has also been taken for granted in multiple ways. Yeah. So, what Rashti is doing is he is unpacking this term, this category, Commonwealth literature, and prompting us to think about many inconveniences which are part and parcel of this category that commonwealth literature and, and that is why the uh, essay begins uh, the, the title of the essay is commonwealth literature does not exist and towards the end of the essay he says maybe I should rephrase this and say commonwealth literature should not exist because it does exist yeah and uh, this is in some length he is it's not like um, uh, coming across uh, um, um, giving for the new category, but he is saying this category has problems and he shares some instances from his own writing experiences from the experience that he gathered from other writers to prove that to illustrate that this is not a useful category anymore and that this is again another way of the an another way of uh, uh, sustaining this sort of uh, uh, the, the, the colonial grip on uh, literature and literary studies yeah, to a very large extent. So, he uh, starts talking about how you know which in, in the in a very typical way he begins just like he began the introduction to vintage uh, book of uh, uh, Indian writing where he shares a personal anecdote first. Here also he shares a personal anecdote where again there is an intersection between uh, the Rashti as an as a writer, as a creative writer and certain academic interventions. If you recall the introduction that he uh, wrote for Vintage Book of Indian Writing, yeah, he there also he begins with a question that an, a, a possibly a research student asked him what fundamentally is the point of Midnight's Children. Yeah. So, always you know there is a way in which <coughs> uh, Rushdi in many of his other writings as well, he tries to uh, show us the contrast between what is really out there as literature, as the set of works produced by particular writers vis-a-vis -vis the interpretations or the vis-a-vis -vis the uh, spaces which are created for this body of writing to exist in an academic or research oriented context. And he more often than not he has been uh, extremely uh, dismissive of these new the the academic based approach towards this set of work because you always sometimes rightfully also argues that that is a delimiting way of looking at uh, literature in general. So, here he begins with the uh, a seminar that he uh, where he was invited to speak this was in 1983 in Cambridge and there the seminar was on um, English literary studies English studies and uh, the organizer it seems told him it is ok. Now, we are uh, now, our understanding is that English studies and Commonwealth literature, yeah, they are one and the same because English, the, that is how 
it is put over here. The seminar organizer or somebody you know, from the British Council, she says it is all right for the purposes of our seminar, English studies are taken to include commonwealth literature. Yeah. So, he begins by saying at all other times English literature is separate, commonwealth lighting is separate. There are certain ways in which conveniently they are brought together and that is where you know he begins to that it is that uh, entry point that he uses to talk about the complexities, the, the political nature of these uh, terms as well. If you think about the term commonwealth literature, uh, 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 term commonwealth, yeah, it does not have any literary import to begin with, it's, it's, it, it very evidently suggests uh, uh, the political nature of the nations which are being brought together and commonwealth in the sense the, the, uh, the well-being of the common well-being, wealth is used in that sense. Yeah. So, it is a political category and when a political category is used to include certain kinds of literature, there will be limitations because the, the category in the first place is formed as a political category, but the moment literature comes in, it just it seems to neutralize the political element of it. Everything can be a part of it. If you think about what is part of commonwealth literature, it is rather easy. Yeah? You do not have to debate much. R. K. Narayan is part of it, Rashti is part of it, Ovi Vijayan is part of it, Anita Desai is part of it, uh, Temsulao is part of it, everyone is part of it. Even those nations such as Pakistan is not strictly speaking a commonwealth nation. Yeah? And, uh, uh, politically, it does not qualify as a commonwealth nation, but the writers from Pakistan are also considered as commonwealth writers. South Africa, yeah, it is not a commonwealth nation at all, but the writers from South Africa are also part of uh, commonwealth literature. Yeah. So, these are certain uncomfortable questions which often are not raised in academic uh, spaces. Um, and, and he also indicates throughout this essay that writers are more conscious of this, yeah, this collapsing of their identities and their writings into a single, uh, uh, you know, a, a single category. Writers are often conscious of it, they always protest that, but that protest, that denial of a certain identity is never seen as a positive thing. It is reported in the media as a negative thing, the academics are more um, cynical in their approach towards these denials. So, he says we are not really taken seriously when we try to deny this category or reject this category. And this is, uh, though he is talking always about in this essay about commonwealth literature, I think it is a useful way to look at most of the categorizations which exist uh, within uh, literary studies in uh, across. He says though many of the, uh, he gives certain examples of uh, Shiva Naipaul and uh, Buchi M. Chatta and uh, Salman Rushdie himself denying this thing, uh, this category of uh, commonwealth literature and he says it was reported in the newspapers. There were three interviews which appeared under the headline commonwealth writers, but do not call them that. Yeah? So, he is very uncomfortable with this sort of uh, uh, the, 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 the frivolous way in which media and some of the uh, literary community as well, the way they talk about it. Yeah? And uh, moving on, we will just talk about a couple of more things. Yeah. And uh, he says whenever these writers got together yeah, as commonwealth writers, they began to uh, realize that they have more, more differences than similarities. There were very few things that could bring them together and they were all uncomfortable again uh, with this idea of them being clubbed together as commonwealth writers. He gives these examples, uh, two examples, uh, Anita Desai from India and uh, the Kenyan writer. Hmm? Gugi, uh, N G U G I. Yeah. So he, um, Anita Desai, we all know about her. And Gugi started writing in English, and he's a Marxist uh, writer as well. And his political views are very pronounced. And then he switched to uh, uh, writing in Swahili. So he is talking about a Commonwealth Literature Conference where Anita Desai's work is presented, and Gugi's work is also presented. And this is how Gugi's work is presented. He is a committed Marxist writer, an overtly political writer, who expressed his rejection of the English language by reading his own work in Swahili with a Swedish version read by his translator, leaving the rest of us completely bemused. Yeah? But this sort of a complexity is not there linguistically speaking when it comes to Anita Desa, it is presented in uh, English, it comfortably and conveniently can be fitted into this commonwealth category. There is another additional complication, Anita Desai. She says, Anita Desai spoke in whispers that her novel is the novel of sensibility. Yeah. So, here is a 
term which is trying to include the works written in English plus the works plus the uh, say, uh, writer who can possibly write in English, who has written in English, but now he is rejecting English and writing in Swahili and refusing to translate that to English, he, uh, his translate, uh, he translates that into, gets it translated into Swedish yeah? and he is political too. And we have Anita Desai who is an apolitical writer, that is how she describes herself and her work is about sensibility that is what she talks mostly about and we did see that as well as we were discussing it. So, this diversity is totally lost over there and both of them are sitting there together and both of them are commonwealth writers, but there is nothing in common, there is nothing that they share in common not even the language. So, he is beginning to question on what basis is this literature formed, commonwealth literature, is it only about national identity and can we have a set of literature solely based on um, national identity and he is also trying to get to a definition of uh, commonwealth literature and the most commonly available definition he shares that with us he says it is that body of writing created in the English language by persons who are not themselves white Britons or Irish or citizens of the United States of America. I do not know whether black Americans are citizens of this bizarre commonwealth or not, probably not. It is also uncertain whether citizens of commonwealth countries writing in languages other than English, Hindi for example, or who switch out of English like Googi are permitted into the club or asked to keep out. Yeah? Here again, in when we look at commonwealth literature from this from our vantage point, if we are talking in India, we are talking about commonwealth literature, it is easy to put in OV Vijayan, yeah? easy to put in uh, a Marathi writer. Yeah? But when we are at the center again, yeah? when we are at the uh, literary center of commonwealth literature and talking about uh, commonwealth, uh, when we are at the center of English literary studies and talking about commonwealth literature, yeah? it is unlikely that the regional writers will make the final cut as Rashti says in the, uh, in the, other, uh, in the other essay. Yeah? Maybe a Premchand can be uh, fitted in, yeah? Tagore can be fitted in, yeah? many others maybe they cannot be fitted in. So, he says this is a very patronizing definition he then this is a definition that he has uh, culled out from many other academic contexts. Yeah? This is how this space has been defined and it is again it is not to say that the idea of commonwealth literature continues to be uncontested, there have been questions raised and there are a lot of people in post colonial writers, many have identified the need to come up with perhaps another category and commonwealth literature is too, it sounds very distinctly colonial and also uh, patronizing, it negates many things that post colonial writings are about to say. Yeah? So, if you, uh, I also want you to recall all those debates that we had in this class about English Pasha divide, about Hindi being the uh, one among the uh, powerful languages within India and sharing the platform with uh, English yeah? and also about English literature versus commonwealth literature now. Yeah? So, is it easy to zero down on one acceptable definition or you know one acceptable uh, compartmentalization of works and say these are the boundaries. If you fall within this boundary, you belong to this category and if you do not make it yeah, you are outside uh, altogether. Yeah, and then um, yeah, and he says this is in 1983. Even at that point of time, when they were all uh, sitting together and talking about Commonwealth literature, none of them liked it. None of the writers liked the term being used. Yeah, but it is. It would not be right to say that now the term is not being used at all. Yeah, Commonwealth literature. In fact, it's even a course which is offered in many uh, countries. If you look at you know some of the competitive exams, and if you are uh, trying to look at the syllabi, yeah? comparative literature, com commonwealth literature, all of this is part of it. Yeah? There have been voices trying to critique it, but we have not entirely done away with that. So, Rashti is saying they all were, uh, none of them liked it, that was an unlikable term and it was more like a, an exclusive ghetto. Yeah? And uh, he, maybe in the other essay, in the introduction to vintage writing, he is also subscribing to the same sort of uh, uh, the, the, the same kind of, uh, what do you call it, he is also making the same mistakes which now he is accusing the others of. Uh, he also had created a ghetto of Indian uh, writing, Indian literature, yeah, that is a different thing altogether. But he says here, 
this ghetto, the, the, the formation of this exclusive ghetto will always make sure that English literature is at the top rung. Yeah? And uh, uh, this is something that he very clearly says towards the end of the novel. He says, the term Commonwealth literature itself, it was invented to delay the day when we, when we rough bees actually slouch into Bethlehem. Yeah? This is uh, his drawing from Eight's uh, uh, poem, yeah? The Second Coming where uh, he talks about the day when the beast will slouch into Bethlehem. So, he is talking about these writers who are pitted against and who are placed in a lower rung of hierarchy compared to English literature and says that the term itself was invented to keep us in this exclusive ghetto. So, if we have the, our terms such as commonwealth literature, yeah, it will always be possible to talk about English literature as being the center, as being as a top uh, occupying the top slot in the hierarchy and no matter how good one is, yeah, he or she will always be a commonwealth writer. Maybe Rashti is also beginning to uh, uh, in, in, in some ways beginning to feel that it does not feel so good to be accepted as one of the greatest writers, but still he is not a British writer. There are of course a few anthologies which talk about um, Rashti as a British writer because he is a, a British national, but we also know that the most common convenient slot that he occupies is that of a post-colonial writer or a post-modern writer or one of the commonwealth writers. Yeah? So, this is this almost seems like a, like a trap out of which they can never uh, um, never come out yeah there are a lot of in fact you know uh, kenyan writers latin american writers yeah who are perhaps as good as or perhaps better than the english writers but when we talk about english literary studies not just in our own context not just in the subcontinent but in a in, in a, as a as a global phenomenon english literature uh, english literary studies there is a center which continues to hold it seems as if, yeah. but Rashti tells us towards the end that it is time to admit that the centre cannot hold. Yeah. There are certain moves of course, but still uh, if you think about a course in English literature, graduating with an BA, with a BA or MA from any part of the world without having done Chaucer or Shakespeare or the conventional British literary history that is unimaginable. Yeah? If you have an MA or BA and if you have the audacity to go and tell somebody, I have specialized in non-British English writing, yeah? that is the focus of my studies, that will not be really accepted. You are of course free to research, you are of course free to move away and take electives, yeah? but the centre remains the same from the time English literary studies was introduced in this uh, country. Yeah? I, uh, I think you, know, you, sh you should take a look at there is this essay by Gauri Vishwanathan where she talks about the beginnings of English education in India, how there were uh, political as well as humanist ideals driving this thing behind introducing English education and our format has remained pretty much the same. Yeah? Which what kind of texts make the cut and what kind of texts are excluded. Yeah? We, we do not have to really uh, travel three centuries to two and a half centuries to find out what exactly happened, we can still go back to the Victorian attitude and the Macaulay's minute and whatever governed these sensibilities uh, during those periods and it pretty much remains the same even today. Yeah? And I, I really have not come across any university which is worth its salt which is offering a course in English literary studies without offering these texts. I am really not saying that we need to do away with these courses, but unless the centre is move to move away and you know make way for other spaces or unless we are willing to look at this as a one large circle without any particular center. The center can keep shifting yeah? unless we reach there many of the discussions that we have in the periphery yeah, may not really uh, may, may not really hold much water. Yeah? Rashti himself in this essay talks about him being asked about his own position of writing from the periphery. Yeah? And he was certainly very, very uncomfortable with that. And this is in 1983 when he had not yet won the Booker and the, um, uh, the Booker of Bookers and the Best of Bookers. Yeah? But even today, this is 2018, even today when we think about Vrashti, yeah, yes, there is again a way in which he can be pushed into the periphery. Yeah? And if that is the case with Rashdi, yeah, 
think about the many other writers. It is very unlikely that they will make it to the center or even to the significant uh, parts of those peripheries. Yeah? And if we think about women writing, if we think about Dalit writing, there is no way that anyone could you know, uh, occupy that space in any way. But the flip side of Rishti's arguments, the flip side of Rishti's concerns is that it is always about finding his own position and his the uh, and his uh, uh, his ilk rashti and his ilk finding their position in terms of the center periphery thing but he is not really he's not really we, we have not really come across any uh, writing by him or any interview by him where he is using this legitimizing power of his discourse to include the ones who are really really in the periphery yeah again no northeastern writing or uh, uh, Dalit writing or women writing, yeah. So, I, I so while this is a useful way to begin talking about the, the the many complexities which are inherent in this field, yeah. Maybe one should also be willing to push this forward and talk about the many more things which which can be included as well, yeah. Not just limiting one to the in English Indian writers who are writing in English, because here also Rashti is mostly speaking for the Indian writers who are writing in English, who are part of commonwealth literature. Yeah? So, just like there, there is a tokenism that he does, of course, you know, he talks about Prem Chand, Anandamurti, yeah? uh, who have you know, produced good work in Indian literature. So he just asks these uh, questions again in a very peripheral sense and moves on to other things. And uh, there is one instance that he shares here. He talks about a Gujarati novelist, Suresh Joshi. Yeah? And uh, he told me that, uh, Suresh Joshi, it seems, told Rashti that he could write in Hindi, but he felt obliged to write in Gujarati because it was a language under threat, not from English or the West, from Hindi. Yeah? So, Rashti is certainly uh, aware of, he is uh, alert to these many um, debates which are happening internally, yeah? perhaps more aware than the regional writers themselves about the complex uh, hierarchy which operates in terms of language yeah and he is also at some level though not directly also telling the regional writers that it is not necessarily uh, about English versus Bhasha it is also about the hierarchy and the privileges which are associated with Indian English languages in varying degrees yeah so Suresh Joshi uh, says the threat is not from English not from the West but from Hindi in two or three generations, he said Gujarati could easily die. And the comparison that he made, Suresh Joshi, the Gujarati writer, the comparison that he made was with uh, to the state of uh, Czech language under the yoke of Russian. Yeah? That's when uh, Milan Kundera had those concerns about what will happen to Czech language because now, uh, this is 1980s, yeah? because it was under uh, the Russian control. Yeah? So, he is at uh, some level. Uh, he, uh, Rashti, of course, does not do it systematically, but he is also trying to do an interconnected reading of literature, yeah, which is not nationality based, which is not based on uh, the language in which it is written, which is not based on the reach, which is not really based on the target audience. He is trying to do a mm, do do a more uh, inclusive way of looking at literature. He even uses the term world literature at some point. Yeah? He says perhaps that is the world, uh, the, the, because world literature is also a field in which a lot of debates are happening now about how to, uh, how to include works which are truly world literature. Yeah? So, there are a lot of debates in terms of translation, in terms of comparative literature, about moving away from national literature towards transnational literature. All of this is happening. So, he is saying maybe we may have to move in those directions without really spelling out what those directions are. And, uh, and one thing uh, he also says is, yeah, I will just read out. So, perhaps I should rephrase myself, commonwealth literature should not exist. If it did not, we could appreciate writers for what they are, whether in English or not. Yeah? I think it applies uh, the, this really uh, uh, um, this is applicable for any kind of literature that we talk about. If you are, if you think about the rise of uh, the novel and the novels that you dealt with, yeah, from that goes onwards. There is a framework which is imposed 
onto any category because a category cannot exist without a framework. And again, it's a very utopian thing to wish away all those categories. We may not be able to do that, but one thing we could do is to be alert to those possibilities. So he says, yeah, this is a limited uh, limiting category because yeah, if it did not, we could appreciate writers for what they are, whether in English or not. We could discuss literature in terms of his real groupings. He again does not say what these real groupings are. One example that he gives is, which may well be national, which may well be linguistic, but it may also be international based on imaginative affinities. Yeah, that is a category we do not really have. Yeah, perhaps you know one thing that I can think about is magic realism. Yeah. It somehow includes writers who are from different uh, nationalities. It's more about the the style of writing. It is more about the post-colonial response uh, in certain overt or covert political ways. Yeah. So Rashti is saying maybe the way forward is to not to just do away with the national and linguistic categories, but also include yeah, something like imaginative affinities. Yeah? And he says, and as far as English literature itself is concerned, I think if at all English literatures could be studied together, a shape would emerge which would truly reflect the new shape of the language in the world. And we could see that English literature has never been in a better shape because a world language now also possesses a world literature which is proliferating in every conceivable direction. Yeah. So again coming back to the first point that I began with about the course, the way the courses are structured. Yeah. I cannot think of a single course which is shaped in this way, which will include all kinds of literatures which are in, in uh, which are, uh, pr which is produced, all kinds of literatures produced in English. Yeah. All writers who are capable of writing in English, yeah. because unless a, a course or even an anthology, yeah, there are certain demands of a framework. Yeah, you need to have a boundary. Yeah, to these are practical concerns as well. Yeah, but perhaps you know if there is a course which just talks about English. Uh, again, there could be many other challenges which would be part and parcel of that. Yeah, but I, I find these suggestions useful in the sense that one really would not know unless you are willing to take a step in that direction yeah bringing it if you think about the uh, uh, let's again come back to the text that you are familiar with yeah how about certain a set of texts written in english from say indian literature yeah and some texts produced uh, or translated into english from world literature yeah a set of writings from post colonialism again 20th century fiction yeah and uh, yeah, and, and, and the certain texts from this course itself, yeah, and a uh, few from comparative literature, yeah, and there is also Canadian literature, Latin American literature, these are certain categories which exist. Yeah. So, what if we bring all of those together? It is certainly a challenging task, a very daunting task, yeah, and we would be totally at loss as to what is the critical material that you would use, yeah, which is that one uh, approach which can include all of those. Yeah. And now if you again you know take into account the uh, the different literary periods, yeah, the context it becomes further complicated. Yeah. So either you know you need to be able to talk about literary periods as a contemporary writings in Indian, uh, contemporary writings in English uh, language. Yeah. There has to be some way in which they can be brought together, some nomenclature is always needed, but the point is that that should not continue to be a limiting category. Yeah. There is uh, there are a lot of you know I think I have mentioned this earlier in the previous uh, courses as well. There are a lot of Dalit uh, thinkers and writers and Dalit critics who begin to argue that yeah, the idea of the center should not be there at all. If at all you feel that even in terms of Dalit writing, the moment the Dalit anthology is brought out, yeah, when you begin to notice that there are a set of writers who begin to occupy the center. Yeah, one should be willing to totally displace that and bring in newer uh, texts, newer discourses. Yeah, the same can be uh, said about uh, northeastern writing. Yeah, if you take a, a any no anthology from uh, of writings from the northeast, we know the writers who are included in that. Yeah, and uh, we know there is Temsula Ao. We know there is. Uh, uh, Tilotama Sharma. Yeah. So there are these Tilotama Mishra. Yeah. We know that there are certain set writers who would always make it. Yeah. So 
I, I know how far this is possible, but I think this would be possible only if one is willing to maintain this constant dialogue with the 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 institutions which are legitimizing the institutions which are canonizing this by you know revamping the syllabi or you know including newer approaches yeah not always perhaps banking on uh, if you are if we are talking about this course yeah we always start with uh, 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 Srinivas Iyengar's story yeah so if there is a different starting point to that can we include more text yeah maybe these are some of the ways in which we also should be willing to open up the courses and you know open up the ways in which we begin to um, approach the discipline approach this space uh, from an academic point of view otherwise as Rushdi says and as many others would uh, also agree perhaps this will become a very redundant exercise if this is not constantly being unpacked and uh, if, if you know 25 years back somebody who did English literary studies if they were doing a certain text set of texts and 25 years later and 25 years from now if we are all doing the same set of texts it should not be something that we are proud of yeah there should be a need to constantly reinvent the, the uh, and put new things inside the box okay yes I think I'm done <laughs> okay any anything that you would like to add Yes, Ranjani. Um, so, would you say that the current of English literature in general is suffering from a lack of an acceptable structure that would be that, that it can be used to organize this kind of writing? Because you said that the idea of the center is not something that all writers are comfortable with. So, in what way can we actually categorize, or should we not attempt an exercise in categorizing? I don't think that's possible at all. No, if we bring in a range of texts there will always be a hierarchy in some form or the other yeah whether texts or individuals or critical traditions or whatsoever it is if you bring in a set of texts hierarchy is inevitable it will always be there but maintaining that hierarchy as something which is carved in stone I think the, the problem starts there using because uh, though Rushdie is raising these questions and this is 1983 Rashti is still a valid voice. Yeah. Rashti is able to, Rashti can afford to make many of these claims and Rashti can afford to um, even get away with many, many things. He's, he's actually done that too. Yeah. But is the same kind of voice available, is the same kind of uh, uh, voice available for, let's say, any of the leading writers in, in any of the Indian languages? Yeah. They can speak for perhaps their own language, their own contemporary writers. Here, look at uh, the Rashti emerges as the spokesperson for not just Indian writers in English. He's the spokesperson for uh, he's a spokesperson for Commonwealth writers from different parts of the world. Yeah, and occasionally he also speaks for English literature. Yeah, so there is a very convenient fluidity which is associated with his own status yeah but coming back to your question Rajani I really don't know whether such a because if you lay out any text any set of texts before us all of which can be non-canonical but again I suspect there will be a center again yeah there will be a certain kind of text which may have more significance in some form or the other and whenever we are thinking about these things in an academic context which has a definite structure in terms of uh, the, there are these bodies yeah, like UGC or Sahitya Academy yeah, examinations these are all systems yeah. and moving out of these systems and doing academics is not a viable option you come back to those right maybe you will do your research on some writer who is very very obscure whose, po whose politics is not acceptable in the conventional sense but the medium the route that you use to enter that academic space is again conventional yeah you go for a PhD interview you are first being tested on whether you are aware of the existing dominant critical tradition yeah how good is your knowledge of the center the knowledge of the center equips you to engage with the works on the periphery yeah that is how it works now yeah 
and if you I, I, I think the uh, better known the, the, the centers which are giving out this kind of knowledge if we take the instance of uh, Oxford and Cambridge yeah it is amazing the, the kind of uh, uh, how invested you know they are in the traditional uh, the, the maintenance of the center or the core yeah they go really deep into Chaucer studies into old English studies yeah it is not as if and, and they have other courses for including the ones in the periphery. The proper English course the purity of that is maintained in in, in, a, in a wonderful way it is you know it is amazing it is uh, we really would be uh, I think within our context at least we are not that invested in maintaining the core yeah. But there you still have scholars who are working on old English language and who are again you know doing a culture studies kind of work on the works which were produced during the old English period yeah. So, I think at multiple levels this is getting reinforced in many ways but this is also I suspect the reason why something like digital humanities is being looked down upon because that entry the entry of technology is always liberating in a certain way yeah because we you begin to see that when technology enters it is it is very disrespectful towards canon yeah. this has happened in in at, at all times when, when when book was first introduced as a technology yeah you suddenly realize anyone could get a book published it was not just about knowing the right kind of circles being in the right uh, ghetto or the coterie yeah. So, technology has always been done wonders which the, uh, the artists or the academic settings could never do. Yeah. So, uh, I don't know maybe there are different different possibilities and just like the world really uh, the, 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 the world of the books where the, the world of letters were reoriented with the entry of the book perhaps a similar sort of a thing may or may not happen at different points of time and of course we need to admit that even from the peripheries a lot of interesting questions are being asked yeah it is unlikely that if you go to a good university and go through their uh, dissertations it is very unlikely that you will still continue to find scores of work on Shakespeare or on romantic poetry yeah there is a way in which people are very deliberately trying to move away and make English literature more inclusive space and also about the idea of the text is being increasingly contested yeah and a lot of discussion about how these tools the tools that you the, the training that you receive as a student of literature should also equip you to do many more interesting things in this larger uh, field okay and I, I think in terms of research we have come a long way academic research uh, even a even in the postgraduate level at least in some of the good places people have been away to move away from just a literary criticism towards some more you know research oriented work yeah willingness to move away from the text and looking at the extra ter uh, extra literary um, aspects of it and etc.